Morning, everybody. Let's get going. There's quite a bit to get through today. And it's been a very busy week for news. It's um, strange. After last week, when it's, everything's quite quiet, there's been loads of stuff this week. We've had to pick the best stories for you, I think. Um, I'm going to be covering a couple of things. Richard Williams, our property guy, is going to be talking about one uh, new issue. And then we'll be talking to Claire Shaw from Scottish Mortgage. Um, all the way through, if you want to ask me questions, just um, stick them in the Q&A function in the Zoom. Otherwise, you can email me on jc at and I'll get them that way. So let's get going. Um, things I wanted to cover, I think, Scottish Investment Trust is, is a big deal. We should probably have a look at that. Fertility Emerging Markets, uh, Life Science REITs, the new issue, and then a few bits and pieces that um, I think we should look back on. Um, starting off with Scottish Investment Trust, I think the chart tells you a lot. Um, the fact that you haven't really made any money out of it uh, for the last four years or so is, is a great indication that something needed to change. And you can see the discount is, is quite wide there all the way through the, the last 10 years as well. Um, it shows up more as we look through the performance numbers, but first just looking at how it stands within the sector. Uh, it's about eighth largest fund, so 500 million is still a decent chunk of money. It used to be a lot bigger. I think I can remember when it was about 800, but obviously it's um, shrunk through buybacks. The discount currently is 5.8. It was a lot wider than that. And that's it's come in as well, see, since um, the news was announced. Reasonable issue yield, but that's not the point of the fund at all, and fairly low ongoing charges. Uh, because it was a self managed fund, so it had its, its um, employed its own managers. And that kept the cost down. Um, there's the performance numbers, though. And as you can see, it's pretty much close to the bottom of the table. I've taken out the numbers from Keystone in there uh, for over a year because they obviously refer to a period when Keystone was a UK trust. So you can see that Solish is, is almost bottom of the sector or bottom of the sector over most time periods. It's going to merge with JP Morgan Growth and Income, as we know. So um, that is doing much, much better. It's the third largest fund in its sector, which is the global equity income sector. Um, but it's the only one trading at a decent premium. And it's offering a decent yield too, as we'll explain in a second. Ongoing charges, about the same as Scottish Investment Trust. That number is all over the place. I think the important thing to, to note is that um, they seem to be going up post the merger, and I'm not quite sure why that is. So um, I think we'll just have to wait and see how the whole thing beds down. But that increase is, is quite minimal, really, from 0.54 to 0.57. Uh, the yield in there gets reset at 4% of the NAV each year, so that will go up. And assuming the thing still trades on a 2 2 ish percent premium, that would be a bit quick to about 3.9% yield on a share price. Market cap is going to end up being the second biggest fund in the sector. So nice and big and liquid and a sort of champion for the, for the global equity income sector, which I think is actually probably a bit small because you've got um, a couple of tiny funds in there or relatively small funds. I think there's probably room for a, another fund to, to uh, launch the global equity income sector, maybe even something to migrate still from UK equity income. We'll have to wait and see what happens. There's the... Um, Performance numbers for JP Morgan Global Growth and Income, and you see it's a very different story. So really, it is at the top of the end of its table um, over most time periods. Partly that's because of its approach. So rather than trying to generate income by um, investing in high yielding stocks, it's investing in um, what it manages to think is sort of the best opportunity at the time, which is a pretty much a growth focus, focus portfolio at the moment and then converting some capital into income to pay this 4% this yield of NAV. Um, and that has worked quite well for it um, over the history of the fund. Um, and it's obviously the, the way this Scottish investment trust is going to be run going forward. So here's the um, sort of part of history of Scottish Investment Trust, um, which we, we looked at before when the, this was all kicked off um, back in June. Stanhope Consulting, who were the external consultants that were helping to decide what the future of the fund was going to be, um, had sort of were involved with a couple of other high profile moves recently. So with Keystone, obviously, they ended up going to Bailey Gifford as a sort of, um, well, socially aware, positive change 
type fund. Um, Temple Bar kept the sort of value manager in place. And I did wonder whether we were going to end up with another value manager, but the board seemed to have been prepared to, to move to um, the JP Morgan fund instead. Um, the new fund, well, the, 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 the bigger old fund, if you like, a JP Morgan Global Growth and Income, it's described as a high conviction portfolio. Um, I think anything over 40 stocks is, is not much of a high conviction portfolio, to be honest, but I suppose within that global sector, it's relatively high conviction. Um, asset allocation is driven by stock selection, but I think there's always a sort of eye to what the benchmark's doing um, with some of the JP Morgan funds, um, just for risk control purposes. Um, it can switch between value and growth styles. That's, that's one of the things that they say about it. And that might be what persuaded the board that um, they were going to make that shift. I think it'd be interesting to see if they ever do make a decisive switch to value. Obviously, we've had the value bounce uh, last November, but that petered out a bit. Um, so we'll just have to work to watch this space. But for now, because of this flexibility to, to distribute capital, it can benefit from the... Um, high performance or higher performance of growth stocks. Um, the way that the um, costs seem to be covered off so that the existing shareholders of JP Morgan Global Growth and Income aren't penalised for doing this is that JP Morgan won't charge a fee for eight months. Um, and that's reasonably jealous of it, I suppose. Um, the whole thing will actually happen with the, the manager shifts across in January, but um, by the time the circular gets published, there is voted on it and, and everything happens. It's going to be done um, sometime in the first three months of 2022. Obviously, everything has to be voted on. Normally, we'd be insisting or that um, or suggesting strongly that there ought to be some kind of cash exit offered for Scottish Investment Trust shareholders. Because the JP Morgan Fund is trading at a premium of about 2%, effectively, then um, you're looking at still quite a decent upside in your shares. So if you... Um, stick with Scottish Investment Trust, you should get a closing of that discount. The shares should move to trade into an asset value to premium. And you should, you should, if you want to get out, be able to sell your shares in the market. So there's no real need for a, a cash exit. Um, unless, of course, suddenly the, the discount swings out on taking more than global growth and income. But I think that's unlikely. So that's enough of that one. Um, Fidelity emerging, I just wanted to mention um, because uh, of what happened this week. So we've been covering this in previous shows. Um, the Genesis Emerging Markets said it was going to appoint Fidelity's manager uh, back in July. It said it would accompany that with a 25% tender and 2% discount. There was a big vote against the, the move on the 4th of October, which I thought was a sign that actually something was probably amiss with this. And if you remember Genesis, um, Emerging where the Genesis, the Genesis manager, I'm trying to remember the call, but yeah, um, they came out and said, We don't think actually that shareholders are desperately in favor of this. Um, and actually, when it came to the tender offer, it was a huge rush for the exit. So, 85% of the shares on the Fidelity Emerging Markets register were tendered, um, but obviously, only 25% can get out. That's, that's a massive amount of money. That's almost a billion quid saying, please give me my money back. Uh, yeah, I'm even prepared to take a 2% haircut to get my money back. Um, that's, that's, from my mind, quite a big vote against the proposal. What you've actually seen there is a, a huge spike out in the discount um, over the last few weeks, over the last week or so, rather. Um, that again, tells you there's an awful lot of unhappiness. What we haven't seen yet is any kind of comment from the Fidelity Board. I th do think, actually, this is something that they're going to have to um, actually make a statement on and fairly soon. The reason that there's a problem is that the register is very, very concentrated. Um, City of London, Wells, Lazard and 1607 are what you might term discount players. So they tend to try and buy things on big discounts and trade them out on area discounts. Um, they're not as activist as they may be, well, some of them used to be, um, but nevertheless, um, when a discount closing opportunity comes along like this, they like to take advantage. And I understand, although I haven't seen it written publicly, that Strathclyde have won an exit too. So that's a huge volume of, of stock that needs to be 
uh, place with new investors if the fidelity merging thing is going to carry on going. Um, whether it's too much of an ask, I don't know. Um, it may be that the stock are prepared to be patient if there are, is another liquidity opportunity provided down the line. We'll have to wait and see, um, but uh, want to watch me. And now I'm going to hand over to Richard for a bit. Right. <clears throat> Thank you, James. Um, yeah, so really excited about this one. Um, there's nothing else like it in the in the REIT sector at the moment. So um, this week, um, there's intention to float of um, life science REIT. So they're looking to raise 300 million um, and they will invest that in life science property. So these are sort of labs, high tech offices, um, testing facilities, data centers, things like that. And they're going to be focused in what they call the golden triangles between um, London, Oxford and Cambridge, um, where the majority of um, the life sciences companies are based, mainly because of the, um, the institutions there like Oxford and Cambridge University and um, London College, um, Imperial College. Sorry. So the, these um, the spin offs that come out of these um, these universities and these companies is, is massive. So that's where the, the large majority of life sciences in the UK. So they're targeting a, a, a NAV total return of 10% a year, 5% dividend yield. Um, and they've, they've put a pipeline together, um, almost 450 million, 305 million of which is under exclusive negotiations. So um, if, they, if they do raise this, they'll, they'll look to, to get it away pretty quickly. Um, 220 million is on uh, built income producing um, assets already and um, 85 million has been sort of put towards um, development opportunities, which will obviously come with a bit more risk, but also a bit more return on that as well. Um, so the sector itself is, is, is massively grown in the UK. Um, I've, I've picked out a stat here of, um, of investment in UK life science companies uh, this year, 2.4 billion. That was to May, so the first five months of the year. Um, against 2.8 billion last year, which was a record year. So it looks like there's going to be an, another record year of investment in, in UK life sciences. Um, and, and this cluster effect that they're going for around this, the, the Golden Triangle um, is exactly what we've seen in, in the US, in, in places like Boston, um, uh, San Diego, and, and, and other places around there. So you, you it's tied to the universities that specialize in this obviously talent coming out of that those universities and also uh, companies that spin out of the university they they sort of create an, uh, an, an ecosystem really where um, innovation can, can thrive so that's that's what's happening in the UK and that's why um, life science Re will uh, initially focus on this sort of golden triangle um, but there's also very little supply there of, of state-of-the-art, fit for purpose um, property. So, um, so you've got this demand and supply dynamic going on, which will, which they hope will, will create um, rental growth, which will, um, which will see them hit their sort of 10% total return target. So the, um, the management team themselves, they're all um, specialist real estate um, guys, two, two of the, the, the most important guys there, Simon Hope, who's uh, head of global capital markets at Savills and also director at um, Warehouse REITs and Simon uh, Farnsworth, who is a, uh, well, sorry, was a uh, managing director at, um, at CBRE Global Investors. So um, specialist sort of track knowledge in, in real estate there. Um, and what was also quite pleasing is that they're going to have skin in the game here. They've committed to investing 3 million in the issue themselves and 15% of their um, advisory fee is going to be paid in shares. So um, yeah, really, like I said at the start, really excited about this one. I think this one's uh, got real potential for getting away and and, um, and and growing rapidly once it does. Just one quick question, Richard, yeah. that's popped up here. Do we know how long the tenancies are for these properties? Not at the moment. Um, I, I'll have to look into that actually. Um, no, I haven't seen any anything on that. I, um, I'll look into that and, and come back to you. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll, 
Yeah, I think it's likely we're going to write more on this as we as this yeah. as yeah, exactly. progresses. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Um, those bits and pieces I promised. Um, firstly, third point we've we've covered a few times. Mitaj came out um, and backed AVI on um, AVI's efforts to try and get uh, a requisition to requisition a, a meeting of third point um, to put some discount control ideas. And the board have said, no, we're still not going to do this. Their, their main argument is that because whatever is discussed is not legally binding on the board, um, they don't have to do it. Um, and they actually came out this morning uh, with a sort of quite a strong rebuttal against AVI. Um, best just, just read these things on our, our website and, and make your own mind up, I think. Um, the other big dispute that's, that's rumbling on is the Gresham House, Gresham House Strategic. Um, there's been a lot of back and forth on that this week. Obviously, Gresham House Strategic is, is trying to, the board of Gresham House Strategic is, is trying to shift the management to um, the same stable as North American Smallers and Odyssean Harwood. And um, Gresham House are a big shareholder in Gresham House Strategic. They're obviously going to lose the management contracts. They're not too happy. Um, there's a whole bunch of shareholders that they've got on their side that have now requisitioned um, a meeting to try to force a return of cash and also a, a wind down of the company. Um, as I've written this morning, um, or as you'll see, you'll see it in the, the weekly email, um, there is a question mark actually because. The, between the, them, this, this sort of group of investors owns 43.7% of the, start, the shares as to whether actually they, they might be construed as a concert party. That's something for the takeover panel to look at. But if they were, um, that might mean they have to bid for the whole thing, which would be quite fun. Um, and talking about sort of technical stuff with corporate governance, the Competition and Markets Authority has announced it's looking at the GCP student living deal. Um, they're going to come back with um, something in a couple in a month or two's time. Um, I suppose it's just one to watch. I'd be surprised actually if they, there's a reason to block that. Um, but um, nevertheless, we must recognise that it's a possibility. So 